Right. Guess we're ready. Hi, thank you for coming. We are uh, going to present on running a private cloud OpenStack as a business. Welcome, everybody. Uh, we'll start off with a couple introductions. Uh, Megan? We're going to go through a couple of introductions, and then um, we'll have some talking points that we're going to go through. We are not very slide heavy. We thought we would talk through a lot of the information and then open it for questions. Um, we want this to be as interactive, certainly, as possible. So even feel free during our presentation to ask us questions if there are are things that you're wondering about or if you're looking for some clarity as well. So my name is Megan Rossetti and I am with the OpenStack operations team at Walmart. I joined OpenStack um, back in the Juno release cycle and I have been working on the program management side of the operations team. Uh, I'm Andrew Mitri. Uh, I'm currently one of the leads on uh, the Walmart's uh, cloud uh, team. I've been doing uh, cloud for uh, large uh, companies for about four years, uh, both at CSC on a Department of State contract, as well as at Comcast and now at Walmart. And uh, I think kind of the premise for this talk, uh, or the genesis of this talk, is you know as we built out private cloud, um, you know uh, usually private cloud starts with a small technology focused team engineering let, let's get a solution out right uh, but as the cloud starts to scale and grow uh, we started to find that it's not just about you know having a bunch of engineers thrown into a team and saying go deploy cloud they're, 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 an ecosystem starts to grow in the uh, larger cloud environments and so we wanted to share a little bit today about those lessons learned and and how we scaled the team and what what type of people we brought into the team to be able to service our internal customers. Um, and, you know, uh, I, I had an awesome uh, boss previously that was, I used to say, hey, we need to run our private cloud, run OpenStack as a business within the company. And so that was kind of the premise and the genesis for this talk. Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, you know, speaking of, uh, you know, uh, our, our last gig at Comcast, you know, when I started there, the team was about uh, uh, four people. So we started off with four engineers and a manager, it was me at the time, and saying, let's, let's, let's knock this out, let's build private cloud out at Comcast. Uh, so within about three years, we grew that to over 30 people um, and a lot of different types. So we're going to talk about some of the growth considerations as we grew that out um, at Comcast. So with the growth considerations, as Andrew was talking about, it's not just engineering. It's not just throwing more engineers or developers or architects at the issue. What we ended up looking at doing was really focusing on big picture. This is evolving. It revolves very quickly. Typically, you're not tripling your team growth within just a few years. So with that comes a lot of consideration. You need the business support to go along with that engineering team. Along with that, project management certainly plays a, a key factor. You also need to look at internal evangelism. As the cloud is growing more and more, you need to have those people, we ended up having a few people actually, that would literally travel to talk with customers, um, looking at big projects, moving on to the cloud, making sure that applications are cloud ready from the start and not just having something come on board, find that maybe that wasn't the best solution, and then trying to troubleshoot as, as it's in production, as it's going along. Um, and then also management grows as well. Um, you look at your team growth. Now do your teams need to be realigned? Then do they need to be repurposed, refocused? And all of that tends to happen very quickly as well. So, uh, you know, as we, we started to start off doing things at Comcast, one of the things we, f we found out quickly was like, you know, cloud for a lot of people within an existing organization is, is challenging, uh, hard to understand. And so how can we provide the best level of support? Uh, and so one of the things that we, we stood up that kind of was a natural fit was an internal IRC back then and said, hey, you know, uh, we're going to staff this with some of the best of our team. Come join us. We can talk about best practices. And it's a public forum, right? It's a group chat. And so people are even a lot of times just sitting in there learning about what other people are talking about. Uh, over time, we migrated that to Slack. But, you know, um, uh, the idea of having this group place where everybody can land and have real-time conversation was a huge win. But one of the things that we actually found over time 
was that we also needed to scale that with people, right? There were so many questions and so many conversations happening, right? Um, uh, that we started to actually have to assign people to a position of like, hey, for these next few days or, or this time frame, mm -hmm. you're going to be quote unquote, you know, responsible for conversations or making sure connections are happening there. Um, uh, one of the interesting things that we also did is uh, recently um, uh, we joined not just uh, like support discussions, but like also strategy discussions and, and technical discussions all in that same room. So it becomes like kind of a learning atmosphere. Um, uh, as we started to scale that out, we also realized the need for internal events and, and uh, internal cloud summits and calls and learning. And so we ended up onboarding an, an internal evangelist, right, resource. Kind of like, you know, Mark Collier made the reference on Tuesday about how Accenture had a call about cloud at 9,000 join. Now, we never had 9,000 join, but uh, that's pretty impressive. Um, but we did have hundreds join. When we would do a call or we would do an internal summit, they were one of the most popular events internally. Um, and uh, we would have uh, we would highlight some of our users. Actually, our uh, big data team that spoke earlier today here, you know, was one of the, the key uh, users about how to use the cloud. And they would give examples. And I think that helped a lot with uh, adoption within Comcast mm -hmm. uh, in terms of onboarding those workloads and making sure those workloads were successful from the get, instead of trying to troubleshoot further on yep. as well. So, you want to hit the next one? It's the same. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, yes, uh, evolution of a production team from technical to, f there Sorry, we go. It didn't. Yeah. Growth considerations. You want to handle that? Certainly. Um, as your cloud becomes successful, and this is, quite frankly, a very, very good problem to have, but one that you need to solve very quickly is capacity and deployment. As your cloud is growing, you find as it is becoming more and more popular, people want to be on it. Um, more troubles very quickly in the company as to how successful and how much this platform meets the needs, uh, needs of a variety of projects. It doesn't just fit one particular type of project. It's pretty w wide ranged. So with that, you have to continuously look at where's your capacity. Um, you want to make certain that you leave enough room. You never want to build out 100% on a platform. Um, you leave about 20% to make certain that as people are um, rolling applications on, as they're spending VMs up, um, taking VMs down, that there is that room for them to be able to do that. But along with that, you need a deployment schedule. And you need to be able to, it's tough to do, but you really have to look at trend analysis. You have to really plan out some of the bigger projects that you have coming on. You talk to your customers about what are their growth plans, what are they looking for in a year, in six months. And you need to work out a deployment schedule along with that. That also comes into hand with upgrades. Um, that's something you're, you're looking at not just version upgrades, but also security updates as well. So your overall health of the platform, of which you have literally a rolling schedule of what is going to fit the customer needs without being um, intrusive to the different applications that you have running. So that brings up a good point. One of the things that we ended up doing is, uh, so we, we had hundreds of internal customers, and uh, and it got to the point where, hey, you know, we, we can't do this ad hoc, and even scaling a ticket system to meet those needs was a challenge. So we ended up uh, standing a CRM, and, and actually hiring somebody uh, kind of like a sales, sales engineer type person to say like, uh, start managing the conversation with these hundreds of customers, asking about where their roadmap, where their capacity planning is, uh, uh, tracking the conversations, uh, because the team, as it scales, like conversations were getting lost, and hey, I talked to this person, whatnot. And so that's where this kind of idea of like, we need to evolve as a business, right? You know, maybe a lot of startups start off with, you know, just a couple of technical people, but as they grow, they need these types of resources. And so we actually found that we needed those similar resources. You know, we need an evangelism. We needed somebody to help with the, the reporting and analytics and all that type of, um, you know, uh, communication out to the customer and out to leadership within the organization. Um, one of the other uh, challenges was uh, as we matured, you know, everybody was asking, well, how much does this cost, right? 
you know, uh, initially it was like, hey, it's cloud, you know, like, come get the cloud, come get you hooked, it's, you know, here's the Kool-Aid, you know, you know, it's free, just come get it. But as you scale, and especially with larger projects, you know, everybody's like, how much does it cost? How much does it cost? Um, we ended up deploying Solometer, we ended up using some showback tools to actually generate a bill uh, for our customers so they could see how much. Um, now, of course, like any large organization, getting to a point of chargeback is quite a challenge. It's probably years out for, for most organizations. But at least for larger projects to come back and say, like, yeah, a petabyte of storage is going to cost this much. A thousand VMs of, you know, uh, XL VMs is going to cost this much, yada, yada. You could get a, a, a big picture of what your cost was, right? And then maybe some trading of budgets. We actually found, though, here's the challenge, right, is while we could estimate how much this, this infrastructure cost, right, we might perform at slightly different levels when comparing it to a, a VMware or a public cloud level. So that's where we came up, you know, looking at what is the total cost, right? Um, including both the labor, the infrastructure and whatnot, and how well we run a specific workload, right? Because we might run those workloads better on OpenStack than you would on a public cloud, less oversubscribed, right? Well, that can greatly affect your TCO. Uh, so those are the type of things that we started to have to model out, and we actually built a team that would take all that data, actually simulate a workload, like, you know, uh, uh, one of the, the key workloads there was running the X1 set-top box. We'd actually simulate that workload across different environments or look at the production workload. What's it take to serve up that number of customers, right? And then tie that all the way back down to infrastructure cost. Well, that is staffing. As you start to grow out, everybody wants to know, what's my TCO to run this workload on that cloud versus on public? or on a different private cloud. Uh, and so that was another growth area within the team. How can we model that? How can we do that? Certainly a big topic of discussion with any type of team growth, and especially with the rapid expansion of cloud adoption, has been being able to sustain team growth. And by that, it's not just hiring. Again, it's not just hiring engineers or developers or managers. It's looking at how do we do this and, and keep the cohesion of a team? How do we keep um, the information where it's been, which is amongst the team, instead of getting scattered or pulled in many different directions? Um, and along with that, you can look at additional tools adoption, um, maybe further automation in which relieves some of the stresses of the routine tasks, maybe those should be automated. Maybe there's another way to look at some of these. So you're constantly reevaluating your workload. And then you're looking at building out a team as well and very quickly. So you want to try and ensure that the team is on board. It's going to be rapid growth. You're bringing in a lot of new people and you're really looking for that team involvement. Um, you want to bring anybody new on board, you want to make sure that the people there are behind them, supportive of that new team member. And the way that we went about this was through a very team-oriented hiring process. Um, all team members reviewed any and all resumes that came through. Um, team members were involved in phone screens. We didn't have the entire team, so we weren't having a phone screen with you know, 15 or 20 people, um, but we'd select at least two to three team members to be on those phone screens to talk to those individuals, and then the feedback went back to the entire team. Again, there was a discussion, what's the next step? Do we bring this person for an in-person? Um, if they came in, then they met with the entire team. And granted, that can be very overwhelming for someone coming in to interview, um, but it also keeps the entire team on board. Um, and if somebody wasn't, due to, for un any reason, if somebody wasn't able to attend one of the interviews, they could put out to the team, make sure that you ask this question, um, there's this follow-up. So again, there was that ongoing discussion. And then afterwards, the entire team made the decision, do we move forward? Do we bring this person on? And that wasn't the end of it. When somebody came onto the team, they were involved in a full team training, uh, meaning that there was a schedule put together for training individuals. And it was rotated throughout the entire team. So it wasn't the same individuals always training on the same subjects. It was rotated through. And we always made sure that newer team members, they trained as well. 
you're not skipping over anybody in the team because again, it's a, it's a process. And what we really found is through this and through this complete transparency with the team that there was buy-in for somebody new starting. There was not a time when somebody showed up and nobody knew who they were or where they should be or what they might be working on or what background they had or if they were in the right department even. When somebody came on board, they had a full layout of, okay, here we go. This is what we're gonna tackle. The other part of having a team schedule is especially in an operations environment, you're dealing with a lot of interrupt-driven work. And it almost never fails that you're going to have something unforeseen happen. You'll have something, you know, never an outage, never an incident. We never had any problems with that. <laughs> never. But it allows room to, the schedule's posted. If you need to, you, you can shuffle things out well. Um, and this was something that we found actually to be very successful um, in doubling, at that time, doubling our team. And then you take it another step further. You look at the entire training process with the team. Um, I, I know, I think different companies have different names for this. Um, personal development days, I don't know how many companies may or may not do that. Um, but as in taking an eight hour time period once every couple of weeks and allowing um, team members to spend that time on something relevant to the cloud team, but it doesn't have to be something that was, for instance, somebody wasn't taking eight hours to um, study the ins and outs of Solometer that they've already been, they're already a SME in that field. Um, but somebody taking a day to learn more about Ansible if they don't have that experience, um, or other features and services we know that there are always new projects coming out. Being able to take that time, really dive into them, to be able to evaluate, is this something that we want to bring on? Is this something that we do want to offer to customers? Giving that time. Um, we also found that rotating schedules, rotating on-call, rotating customer support, um, and whether that's with customer tickets or as Andrew was referring to the customer support channels as well trying very diligently not to have the same person always answering or always responding. Um, and to be very honest, we also found that by setting a schedule, we always had somebody, we knew there was coverage. There wasn't a question about, okay, maybe, maybe I'll just be quiet for five minutes and see who else picks it up. There was that accountability, um, which was very important to be able to move everybody through as well. And then training as a whole. Uh, training is huge. You have new training and you have ongoing training. New training certainly with somebody coming into the team and then also with different services and features that are coming out. Um, so deciding, okay, maybe somebody who wants to be a SME more in this field, um, you send some people to that type of training and then they bring it back to the team in the form of a brown bag or in the form of shadowing. Um, especially on an operation side, and with engineering as well. Definitely. We try to do a lot of cross-training. So if we have somebody on operations who is more, well, not more, but who is also interested in the storage side, setting up time for those people to work together. Um, and we found that that cross-training really helped just throughout builds, throughout future planning, and if there had ever been any outages or anything along those lines. Um, and then also with um, training as far as um, making sure that the newer individuals are also involved in, in training as well. You, you certainly go through kind of another level of understanding when you have to turn around and make certain that somebody you're working with then understands that. There's sort of a whole nother whole nother level to ensuring that you understand it yourself as well. So the other opportunity that we had was um, as, as more customers were coming on the cloud, they were asking for deeper dives around how do we onboard on the cloud and how do we become cloud native? 
And so we started to put together resources that would actually focus around, um, you know, loosely what we called sales engineering or consulting or enablement, uh, you know, that could actually travel out and meet with these teams and spend, you know, days saying, hey, this is what what your application should look like, this is how you should do it, or these are what we've seen as best practices and what works. Um, what was interesting is we'd also take that information back and say like, well, these are the things that we need to do on cloud mm -hmm. uh, to better support these workloads, and, and to, whether it be from a performance or a feature perspective. Uh, and uh, that would turn into the backlog that we had on the team about uh, delivering out to cloud. So, uh, you know, uh, as part of this story, so, you know, uh, Megan and I were at Comcast. Uh, you're probably wondering why we're talking about Comcast. We're in Walmart Vest. We just recently joined Walmart, uh, and we're hoping, uh, we're excited about a challenge to do something similar for, for all Walmart uh, with the uh, rest of the Walmart team. And uh, would love uh, for any of you to join us. So, Pingus, uh, you know, we're, we're, we're hiring. Um, you know, it's an exciting uh, challenge at the Fortune One company, the largest company in the world. Um, and, uh, and so uh, we're excited to kind of hopefully uh, take it to the next level there. Mm -hmm. So what we'd like to do is really take the time and start answering some questions and really dive into um, maybe some areas that you're wondering about or um, even some, some problems that you've experienced in trying to build out um, more as a business. And there is a mic up here. Um, I don't know if it's going to be easier to try and pass it around or... We can repeat, that's fine. Go ahead. Mm -hmm. So the question is, who were the customers that were not suitable and why not uh, for, for cloud? Who, were, who wasn't cloud native and why not? Um, and I think that's a great question. And I would almost challenge to say from an application on our side, almost everybody has a part of their application that might be cloud native, but maybe not the whole stack. So one of the approaches that I thought we took was uh, very successful is, uh, you know, the, the, the leadership did a great job saying, hey, cloud first, think cloud, like go cloud native, right? And people would come say, well, my, my, my technology stack will never run on cloud, right? And um, there might be parts of that, which is true. But, you know, almost everybody's got a caching tier, a web tier, an app, some kind of tier within that application that is a decent fit for moving to cloud, right? It maybe isn't persistent. It can be slightly re-architected to work in cloud. And so what we would work with teams would be were to identify those things and say like, hey, we, we're looking at the residential email platform and yeah, you know what? Caching can work on cloud just fine and they actually need to add a ton of it, right? Why don't you, instead of buying a bunch more physical boxes to do that, try doing it on cloud? Hey, it worked. Uh, let's scale that up. They start to scale it up. Well, what about moving over this piece that we need too, right? Uh, if we just do one little change here, now we can move that part of our stack over. Maybe the core doesn't move, but all the other parts of their stack move. And then that team, when they're starting to look at what's the next gen platform, right, because they want to they wanna update what they're delivering, right, they already understand cloud concepts because they've deployed, you know, one third of their stack on cloud successfully, right? They've managed it, they know how to operate it, they know how to monitor it, they know how to do all those things. And they're like, well, when they go to the vendor or they decide to design it in-house or however they want to approach that problem, they're like, well, we need something that fits the cloud native model and no longer need somebody else from outside to come and say, like, this is how you go cloud native. They get it, right? And because they see those benefits at cloud. So yeah, I mean, to be honest, we weren't onboarding like Oracle rack workloads on the cloud, right? We were looking for things that were cloud native. Excellent question. What, so the question was, was this uh, cloud team formed with an existing IT or was it outside existing IT? Uh, initially, this team was formed within a group called Product Engineering at the time, and it was a group that built products. Um, and uh, it was probably outside what you would define as existing IT. Um, and it was chartered with being able to deliver infrastructure faster for those products. Uh, over time, the success of that team enabled it to be kind of unified and become the de facto platform across all Comcast, but still operated under a group at the time called Platform Technologies. Um, uh, and, uh, and the idea being this has become the de facto platform that we deliver our products, services, and even some of the back office IT on top of. Any 
Any other questions? Excellent question. Um, so the question was, uh, regarding TCO, how scientific were we about it? How, how much in detail, you know, how did that affect the output and comparing with, you know, other cloud options? Um, so TCO can be incredibly complex, and I think our challenge actually might have been not being too scientific, because once we go down that route, uh, it might take months to get an answer versus uh, trying to estimate some of those. I would say most of our challenges actually in con calculating costs were around what parts of labor do we include, uh, you know, and separating those things out. Like if, it, if there's a team working on new features, but they're not being necessarily leveraged, do we count that as part of the TCO, things like that? Because labor is obviously a very big part of the cost delivery for cloud. Um, uh, I think though, uh, over time that we iterated on that model, trying to be accurate. So, I mean, we, we counted everything from data center space to network to uh, labor, um, uh, trying to bucketize them into right categories. We were measuring actual workloads deployed across those different clouds. Um, uh, I, I mean, I don't think it was precise to the, the nth degree, you know, but it was a pretty good model, but it did take uh, a significant amount of resources to bake that model and get it out there. Um, uh, but I think it was worthwhile because in the end it did show that uh, the investment was worth it. So I don't, I don't know that I can say numbers, but you know, it did show that it was a, a worthwhile investment. No, it was cheaper. That, that much I can say. Yeah, yeah, it was cheaper. I, I think I could say that safely. Yeah, uh, yeah significantly cheaper. Any other questions? Cool. Well, thank you, everybody. Uh, if you guys have direct questions, we'll be available here. Thank you.